Hotspurs, hot spurs, welcome back. Talking Tottenham every week, no better place to be sat. If it's a win, lose, draw, we'll be here for a chat. Best believe we tackle topics like Romero in the back. Young Min Son, what can go wrong when he's on form? It's a dream come true, so sit back, relax and vibe with us. Special... Hello and welcome to another episode of Holly Hotspurs Live, where we do have, sadly, a frustrating draw to dissect this evening. But to do so, I am joined by three fabulous guests. First of all, I'm joined by Winnie. Winnie, how are you this evening? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me back on. It's my hat-trick. It's my hat-trick appearance. So, you know, it's becoming more regular now. I like it. But yeah, no, I'm all good, thank you. Thank you for having me on again. No, glad to hear it, Winnie. And I'm also joined by the legend that is Chris Cowling. Chris, how are you this evening? Holly, very well. Very tired from the trip up to Everton at uh, the weekend. But yeah, I'm doing all right. And thanks for having me back on. No worries. Thank you for coming on. And also joined from across the pond, we're joined by Dakota once again. How are you, my friend? Uh, I'm great. Thanks for having me on again. The internet is a wonderful thing sometimes when it allows us to do things like this. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for having me. Excited to no. chat about this, no. this match that was not super exciting. Indeed, it is going to be, there's a lot to dissect, to say the least. Um, welcome to everybody that's tuning in as well. Becky's already in. Thank you again, Becky, for tuning in. Um, but let's dive straight into it. And Winnie, I'm going to come to you first, because I think going into this game, obviously after the Brentford one, we are kind of on high spirits, weren't we? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, we, we kind of got over the line against Brentford, so to speak. Um, we made it a lot more difficult than we probably should have, but it was a win nonetheless. And, you know, it was going into the game with a win, but... I was optimistic, you know, Goodison, Goodison Park's a difficult place to go, uh, regardless of the of where they're sitting in the league. Um, they're, they're kind of only there with the points deduction. I know they haven't been fantastic this season, but it's still a difficult place to go. You know, it can be an intimidating atmosphere for, for some of the players. But as you say, the optimism was high on, on the back of a win. But I mean, probably didn't play out that way, did it? <laughs> <laughs> It tends to be the thing at the moment, I suppose, which is, is rather frustrating. But Chris, for you, were you kind of on the same way? Obviously, you went up to the game and stuff. How were you kind of feeling going into it? Going into it, extremely confident. I think every Spurs fan were was you know extremely confident going into the game. But of course, it is a it is normally a difficult place to go. Although Goodison was extremely quiet. You know, the fans were were very. Uh, it was a very weird atmosphere in, inside Goodison on Saturday. I know it was an early kickoff and all that, but. Of course, Everton do make it very tough, uh, a very physical side. They had so many injuries. They had so many problems on the pitch. And, uh, you know, I think really you've got to give credit to the, the opponent sometimes. And I think Everton uh, played very well. But walking back to the car after the game, I felt bitterly disappointed because I felt that we had so many more opportunities in them and you know we should have put the game to bed. And, you know, it's that same old thing that we need the third goal and, you know, you need to put the game to bed. But... I think really, I know Ange Postacoglu um, has, has been a shining light on this football club, but you know the subs late on, I was disappointed and I felt the game really did change when the likes of James Madison went off. And I just think that sometimes you just need to see out games like this, the likes of Brian Hill coming on. I just didn't see the point. Um, you know, I'm not blaming any individual player, but we should be talking about a superb performance by Mickey van der Ven. And I think that that has been overshadowed by a very disappointing result dropping two points but overall I don't want to come on here being negative overall I think that you know the season so far has been fantastic I don't think anyone would have thought that we'd be fifth you know only a few points away from the top four and you know not that many points away from top spot either so I think it's been a, a very good season so far and uh, you know like Anne said a couple of weeks ago it's about perspective and I think that the, the, the fans need to have perspective on, on this season uh, you know it's a big rebuild that you've gone through and uh, a lot more to come, a lot more exciting things to come as well. And it's great that you mentioned that as well, because obviously I think we were all frustrated. I mean, Dakota, were you, obviously, I'm assuming you were as well. It's just a way to come away with that game and, and feeling almost not a loss, but it's two points dropped, isn't it? Yeah, I feel like every draw, you kind of feel like, was it a, a win or a loss? You know, draws rarely feel like, yeah, that game deserved for both teams to walk away with a point. And this one felt like a loss. Um, Chris, you mentioned you felt like the game kind of turned when Madison came off. I was most disappointed, I think, with Hoybier going off, which I think is maybe a weird thing to say because his form has been so up and down. But I felt like he had a wonderful match against Everton. And when we and maybe it was the change of shape more than personnel going on and coming off. Um, but it it, uh, it it felt like that was the moment of disjointing, which 
you know, was all of stoppage time, which is arguably, you know, that's the moment that is the ultimate seeing out um, point of the match. So, um, yeah, I also was kind of disappointed with the with the changes. But again, because of the result um, and why they why it happened. So. No, I, I think you're right, and, and I'm glad that you've brought up Hoiberg because really it kind of moves me on to the next point. Because obviously there was one change in that lineup was that Skippy was out and Hoiberg was in, and Hoiberg for me winds me up something chronic. But you know what? I think the last game against Brentford and obviously in this game as well, I thought he wasn't too bad. I, I, I you know, I'm not someone who will critique a lot of players. You know, the, the, but, but Hoiberg, isn't, you know, I'm not his biggest fan. However, as you as you say, you know, in the last couple of games, I, I have been hugely impressed with him. He, he looks like. You know, I think I feel like recently he's looked like a player that is kind of is even though he's he's you know been told that he can leave if he wants to, even though the window's shut now. He would look like a player now that's like resigned to the fact that he's going to stay here and fight for the team. And I feel like maybe his performances before that were one of a player that was happy to leave if an offer came in, which we knew that was the case anyway. But yeah, I've been impressed with him. But I mean, sadly, I feel like when we get a full strength squad back, um, you know, when Basuma comes back and we've got a fully fit Madders. Um, and even even Decky in that midfield, um, I feel like Hoybier is an off the bench player. But again, I'm not against that because I, I like him as an option to come off and see, you know, come off the bench and see a game out. Like, let's say, for example, with 2 1 up in Goodison Park, Hoybier can come off the bench and maybe add something a little bit of a, a little bit solid, a little bit more solidity in the midfield. So I, I'm not his biggest fan, but I have been impressed with him as of late, as you say. Um, but maybe when we've got a fully fit squad, as I say, he'll be back on the bench. <laughs> and I, I think that's the thing. I think when he's obviously given the chance to step up and, and be given a job, I think it works well for him, doesn't it, Chris? In the sense that, I think we spoke about it before, in the sense that he's got that thing about him. If you need a job done, it go and do it. Absolutely. He, he's a, a true professional. But I would say that under Ange, you know, particularly at the start of the season when we were unbeaten after 10 games, whenever the team was celebrating, Hoybier was always the first one down the tunnel, not celebrating with the rest of the squad, which I found quite strange. However, whenever called upon uh, under Anne so far this season, he has done a very professional job. Um, you know, he, he's been the ultimate professional in that regard. I was actually very surprised when he didn't leave in the January transfer window. Um, but, you know, of course, it's about players grabbing opportunities. I think that he is just very limited in his abilities under and in this system. Don't get me wrong, I think Hoybier can be a fantastic player in the right team under the right manager. I just don't think it's going to be at Spurs under Postacoglu. But, you know, whenever called upon, he's done a great job. Mm, definitely. And I think the thing is, I think we were all kind of hoping, Dakota, that Saar was potentially going to start over Hoiberg. In terms of, I know we said that Hoiberg had a great game against Brentford, but I think seeing him back, um, obviously, um, from the FCON Cup of Nations, that he was going to be the guy that was potentially going to step in. Or do you think it was the right call for Ranj in a sense that you've been away for a little like, a while, obviously you, you've come back um, on the plane. Do you think that was probably the right call to, to bring him on later on the game? I know we touched on the subs already. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I, I think Hoiberg earned, earned a start with his performance against Brentford, and I think it's smart to to ease Popsar back in. Uh, he played a lot of football um, during his break, and you know, kind of infrastructure-wise, Africa playing in the African tournament is a lot different than you know uh, playing in a, a tournament in Europe or or even the the United States, it's a lot of bus travel rather than, than plane travel. Um, so I think giving him a break and letting him kind of ease back in is, is the right call fully expect for him to start, um, this upcoming weekend and kind of get back in the groove of things. I think his kind of progression, we really missed that. Um, I think we were hoping that he would bring that when he came onto the pitch. And I think we saw why he didn't start, um, just looked, you know, a touch off of it, a look, a looked a touch tired. But full week of rest, a few minutes in the legs, should uh, should be getting back to his uh, his peak self by the weekend. Definitely, I hope so. And obviously, I want to go right to the start. I know we've skipped a few bits, obviously, with who was signed, who wasn't. Um, but kick off, Winnie. The fact that that man Richarlison, and we've spoken about Richarlison quite a lot in terms of is he going to be the man for us? Um, but he scores again within four minutes, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, obviously, over on our, our part lane pod, uh, young young Harry's um, a huge advocate for Richarlison. At the start of the season, he made this completely outlandish um, remark and said he would hit about 20, 25 goals this season. 
Uh, and and we, we laughed at him. I'm going to be honest. We completely laughed in his face. Um, but look, I mean, he, he's, he's, he's getting there. He's, he's slowly, slowly getting there. And I said uh, yesterday on, on, on our pod that I need to go and see this surgeon because whoever he is, he's an absolute miracle worker because he, he's he, honestly, he's transformed Richarlison. And I say transformed, you know, we're seeing shades of what we used to see when he was at Everton, you know, this tenacity, uh, the finishing, the kind of things that he's been lacking since signing for Spurs. But look, he, he is a player on form and, there's obviously there's there's talks of people uh, people saying that we need another striker in the summer. I'm not so sure whether we do, to be perfectly honest. If if Richie if Richie can carry on the you know the form that he's in, I don't see why we wouldn't need another one. But yeah, as you say, we we we're used to watching Spurs start you know poor um, on the back foot, but this this game was completely different. And as you say, it was a, it was a great move and and it was it wasn't an easy finish for Richarlison, but you know he put it away. And I, I liked his celebration, to be honest. He kind of forgot who he was playing against went to went to celebrate and then you know showed a bit of respect but no it was a great finish it was and I like the fact that you mentioned it was quite a hard finish because Chris the ball got zipped in with some pace from a doggie didn't it it's funny actually because Richarlison uh, in a Spurs shirt up till the Everton game he always seems to take that extra touch but both finishes on Saturday absolutely superb first time finishes took the goals extremely well and as Ange keeps saying I think there is so much more to come from Richarlison and as Winnie said there um, you know since the surgery and since coming back he has been a completely different player and I think this is the Richarlison now that we all thought we were buying uh, when he signed from Everton so uh, long may this continue but as Ange said I think there is so much more to come from him and uh, you know he can get a hat full more goals. I really hope so. And I think that's the thing, Dakota. I think, obviously, with us, I hate to say his name on this podcast every time, but as we all know, Harry Kane was was the golden boy. And it's nice that now that Richard, I'm not saying he's going to reach the heights of Harry Kane, but it's now nice that Richie is hitting some sort of form, isn't it? Yeah. it's you know This is the $60 million player who bought from Everton. I don't know if he's an $80 million player like they they claim he is, but 60 sounds right. Um, and you know, he, it, it's nice that he's feeling like himself again. And I think this is, you know, every, it, I think the whole, it was a holistic issue, him not, not scoring. Um, you know, I'm not sure that it was a coincidence that he didn't score a goal with his feet for us until earlier this year. Um, cause his feet weren't feeling good. His legs weren't feeling good. So he's got his issue sorted out and now he's playing like the Richarlison that we were all excited about coming in. Um, and that's exciting for us because it, it means that we don't necessarily have to rely on human son to score every single goal. You know, we can get through, we can win a match for the first time in five years without Harry Kane or human son on the pitch like we did last weekend. So i um, excited for Richarlison. I, I, you know, if he can get to 25 winning, that'd be real nice. Um, Cause that's 15 goals the rest of the way, which is uh, would be quite a haul. It would be. I, I hope that is the case because, like we say, we've we've wanted Richie and we've all been behind Richie to be able to to kind of reach those heights. It's just nice for him to start putting the ball in the back of the net. Um, before we move on, I want to say a big thank you to Time Added On. I still don't know how you do a raid on YouTube, so thank you very much to everybody that's tuning in. Uh, really do appreciate it. Um, and Winnie, I'm going to come to you because obviously it was all plain sailing until the equaliser came. So, what did you kind of make uh, of that goal from them lot that they managed to score? Uh, it's 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 just frustrating, isn't it? I mean, it's. Uh, I'm, I, I had this conversation with. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, everyone had the conversation after the Man City game with the with the way that goal was conceded, um, and I actually, in fact, I said that that the Man City one uh, wasn't a foul on Vicario, and I stand by that because I feel like the 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 contact was before the ball was in play, which you know, albeit can be a little bit of game playing. Um, I feel like that's 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 okay, but this one was ridiculous, and I'm, I, I'll, I'll I'll say this until I'm blue in the face. There is no way that that Harrison is not impeding Vicario. Um, look, he people there's calls for him to be stronger, and I get that. Um, but if you are physically impeded, it's 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 almost impossible to catch a ball and hold on to it. So I I, I do stand by it, um, and I think this one was a foul. And I do I do feel like some you know sometimes goalkeepers get too much protection. Um, but they're just there's, there's too much inconsistency at the moment. We need we need it to be straight. It's either a foul or it's not a foul because what's going to happen is next week there's going to be a similar issue that's going to get called for a foul. Um, 
the one frustrating factor for me, and I don't and I don't understand why we haven't done it yet, is just get someone in between them. It's not difficult. It doesn't have to be a Romero. It doesn't, you know, because we want Romero in the box for his aerial ability. Just get someone, a Hoybier, if he's on the pitch, he'd be perfect for it. Just get him in between and just push the player out of the way. Give Vicario that little bit of space. But for some reason, we, we just seem to be playing with our luck a little bit and hoping that the ref's going to going to call it for a foul. But they're not going to do that at the minute. So we need to learn from it. And hopefully, you know, we don't see it happen again anytime soon. I was going to say once is enough um, and then we saw it twice um, but Chris I, I get what Winnie's saying in a sense that if the ref is going to be inconsistent which we seem to talk about every single week if not um, for every game in a kind of sense is he right in saying that maybe we should put a player in because I was thinking that's that's normal defending I remember when I played football we'd always have a man uh, in between the, the goalie and the opposing player surely we would have clicked onto that do you not think? Absolutely. Uh, but I do agree with a lot of what Winnie just said there. Apart from, um, I didn't think it was a foul. I think that Vicario does need to be stronger. Um, but I do think that we do need a man in there to you know, sort things out. And I'm surprised that that wasn't um, the case against Everton on Saturday, particularly you know after that Manchester City incident. And I think that this is going to happen week by week now. Vicario is going to be a target um, on corners and set pieces, You know, particularly uh, now that we have conceded eight goals 90 minutes plus this season that is not good enough defensively it's all it's all well well and good playing hands ball and playing super attacking football but you need to get the basic right and I think that that is a, a real basic that you know it, it needs to be put right as soon as possible mm, I think so and I think that's the thing the fact that, that we see I think it's every single corner I know that Everton scored a lot of their goals from set pieces but Dakota it, it is something like Chris said like when he said that we do need to kind of work on. I mean, we have a set-piece coach. Um, I'm sure he does defending as well. So it's something that hopefully is worked on. Yeah, I I felt like I saw a change even from second half to first half um, against Everton. Vicario looked a lot more aggressive coming to get the corners. Um, it did help. We gave away less corners. We only had three given up in the second half versus I think it was like six in the first half. Um, so we cut that number in half. It's a little less dangerous there. But um I, I think that we'll see corners being defended um, drastically differently starting on Saturday. I don't think we're going to give it another minute because, like Ange said, um, Chris, like you just said, like we've all said, the calls aren't coming. So we can't rely on the officials to do the job for us. We've got to be aggressive. We've got to defend them uh, heartily. And I wonder if part of it is we're looking to kind of to to play quickly. So – if we get a foul called quickly, we can start quickly. But also, if you go catch the ball, we can play quickly from there. So um, I, I hope that we change the, the change our approach to more of the latter, be more aggressive on defending those corners, and let's get the ball, get in our shape, and then play rather than you know trying to play play before we even have the ball. Mm. It does seem to be one of those things that we are trying to do. Like I say, we want to play quickly. Let's just get the ball under control first. Um, but it was obviously interesting and frustrating. Uh, but then Winnie, that man again that we've already spoken about, Richardson, pops up again. And I like to call it a whiz bomber because it was an absolute rocket that went into the back of the net, wasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, 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 unfortunately, I didn't get to the chance to watch the game because I was on the way to play football myself. Um, but I was, you know, just scrolling through Twitter, Twitter, just update, update, just hoping there'd be something. And then... Lo and behold, there was just updates flying through. And I think Wiz Bomber did come up in one in someone's tweet. Maybe in yourself, I don't know. Um, but yeah, what a goal. And obviously, I managed to catch it afterwards. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's a great finish. There's no, you know, it, and the thing is, what I don't understand, it was kind of obvious where he was going to place it, the way that he shaped his body, but the keeper still couldn't get anywhere near it. So yeah, and it was good to see uh, Madders, obviously, with the with the little assist. You know, he, he looks a little bit out of, uh, out of, not out of shape, but just out of form, out of fitness. Um, but still a little bit of quick feet to shift it into Richie and, as you say, an absolute whiz bomber into the into the top corner. And, you know, hopefully there's a lot more of those to come because, um, as we say before, he's, he's getting in form and if he can produce the, the goods like that every week, then there'll be some very happy Tottenham fans. There will be, indeed. And I'm glad that you mentioned, obviously, the, the little feet, the quick feet, should I say, from Madison. Because, Chris, it was a bit of pure skill from him, wasn't it, to create the space and give it to uh, Richarlison? Yeah, incredible to have uh, Madison back. You know, we've really missed him and... Uh... You know, hopefully he can stay fit now until the end of the season. But yeah, certainly a wizard in the uh, in the centre of midfield for us. And you know, another excellent finish uh, from Richarlison. As I said earlier, you know, first time finish. Goalkeeper didn't have any chance at all of saving that. And long may that continue. But 
Um, one thing that dis did disappoint me on Saturday is the amount of times that we gave the ball away. And I, I haven't really seen that a lot under Ange Postacoglu, which I found quite strange. And, and also, as I mentioned earlier about Mickey van der Ven's performance, I thought was absolutely fantastic. He had Romero next to him and Romero, you know, on a number of occasions gave the ball away, which is quite surprising for, for a player of that quality. Um, but yeah, as you say, Madison, uh, great assist and, and a great finish. I mean, staying with you, Chris, why Why do you think that was? Do you think it was potentially the fact that, I don't know, Everton were kind of pressing us more than we may have seen other teams do so, do you think? Yeah, they did. They did press us a lot and uh, they, they frustrated uh, the Tottenham side. And as I said, they Everton had so many injury problems. You know, Sean Dyche going into this game in his press conference was, was saying about how many injuries he had and how many problems he's had. I know, of course, Spurs have had lots of uh, injuries and suspensions this season, but Everton are at their bare bones, you know, so to go to Everton, you know, I fully expected the win, um, but yeah, they did frustrate us, they did press us, and uh, they worked, you know, very, very hard, and, uh, you know, in the end, they did deserve the point, although I was very disappointed as a Spurs fan. Mm. And I think that's correct. I think in the terms of, like you say, it's just the frustrating of it. And, and Dakota, obviously, we get in, onto that that last goal that they managed to equalise late on. But it was like kind of Chris said, it kind of just slumped off. We just really didn't seem that we were going to create anything else. And you were just waiting for the point of um, them going to equalise, wasn't you? Yeah, I, it seemed like we had a, a stretch, um, you know, maybe around 75th minute mark um, where we had a really good spell of possession seemed like we were moving the ball really forward. We just couldn't quite turn the screw far enough to get that third goal and uh, came back to bite us. So um, I, I think once, you know, we get all of our first team squad back, um, Eve Basuma is coming back. He's maybe been dealing with a little injury um, seems like. So maybe a, another week or so before he actually is back in the squad um, now that Sonny's been gone as long, he might as well win the whole thing and come back in high spirits with the trophy. Um, but, you know, once we get everybody back, it's going to be a really tough decision for Ange on who to play and win, which is a great problem. But hopefully, um, you know, having the captain back will give that little bit of spark um, and, and he can inspire everyone else in the squad to to play the full 90 and to put that little bit of extra effort into seeing out the games. And, you know, I, I think Romero is a great captain. I think he leads, he leads well. I think he's got a little bit more to go um, before he can really kind of step into that and kind of have that presence about him that, that son has. Um, Holly, last time I was on, I talked about giving the armband to son kind of makes everyone feel like they're wearing the armband because of the relationship they have with Sonny. And, you know, Cootie's won a World Cup, but he's still got, a you know, another season or two before people maybe feel that way about him. So um, lessons learned, hopefully. And uh, let's not have any more of these discussions. Let's keep this at eight goals conceded in stoppage time instead of nine or ten or more <laughs> <laughs> yes please um i don't want to go to last year it was like therapy mondays every week um yeah. <laughs> i'll just keep it to that many goals conceded um but when i am going to obviously talk about that goal conceded because uh, it leads us on nicely and i know that the, the key word for tonight is frustrating um but again i don't know whether it was a lack of confidence concentration but it's literally in the dying moments as well yeah, um, obviously it's easy to switch off that late into a game um you know sometimes you can think the results there you've got you've got the three points and all it takes is for for one it, what the thing that's annoying me the most is we, we concede a lot of goals from set pieces yet we give away so many set pieces um and obviously you know as, as much as i love decky silly silly cheap foul to give away in in in, in, a, in in a dangerous position um and we just don't need to be doing it because we're conceding goals from set pieces as i said so yeah and i think you know obviously people talk about the romero header um, whether he misjudged it, whether he needed to take a step back and, and to be able to, to you know, to, to, to head it clear better. But, and again, I've, I've seen strokes of people um, blaming Vicario again, saying he needed to be stronger and out there and, you know, try and try and block the player who, who headed it in. But as you say, it's just frustrating. That just seems to be the, the key term of the, of the game was frustration. Um, but I just like, I hope we just don't make silly fouls in silly areas anymore because we need to learn our lesson quickly 
Um, and, you know, we've got games coming thick and fast again. So hopefully we don't see any of these silly mistakes again happen um, at home against Brighton. Hopefully. And I think I think the thing is, the fact that you said, obviously, it was a silly thing to give away. But Chris, like we just said, we know that Everton are great at scoring from set pieces. So that's another reason why we shouldn't have done it. Absolutely, yeah. Throw-ins, corners, any set pieces, you know, at Goodison Park against Everton. You know, it's, it's like a Sean Dyche masterclass, isn't it? Um, it is frustrating, given, given the free kick away, not clearing the ball, uh, not being focused. And what... what frustrated me more than anything is the fact that at that, at that time where Dragusin, Romero and Van der Ven all on, you'd think that that defence would be absolutely solid. Uh, and of course, Vicario at the back. Um, yeah, frustrating all round. Um, you can't keep giving free kicks like that away. And I think game management in the last couple of minutes, you know, we used to be so good at that. I hate to say it under Maurizio Pochettino back in the day. You know, we used to go right to the very end and, and, and we, we used to be the ones scoring the goals, not conceding them. But we definitely need to sort that out, uh, you know, mentally uh, and, and go right to the very end. Because mm. it, it's interesting you'll see because about Dragosin and, and Dakota, I come to you. I thought moments in that dying game, he was giving me heart attacks because I feel you got lucky with a couple of challenges. I think one of them he managed to, like, uh, what was it? Uh, I don't know if he elbowed someone off the ball, but it pretty much was borderline. So, again, that's yeah, that's it. Yeah, it kind of comes down to game management again, like Chris said, in in those kind of instances. Yeah, I think that you know this is at least twice in a row that we've switched to a back three in the waning moments of the games, and it's gotten a little bit nervy. So, I don't know if that's just hey, Dragishin, thanks for choosing us over Bayern. Here's a few minutes. Uh, or if that is like an actual strategy or, you know, it could have to do with people being, being out, you know, our, our subs would look vastly different if everyone was back, you know, it'd be Timo Werner coming on instead of Brian Hill. Um, it'd be, you know, maybe Brendan Johnson coming on for Decky instead of the other way around. Maybe Horbier is coming on for Basuma instead of bringing on a third center back and changing shape. So, um, you know, I don't know what that will look like. That's up to Ange. Um, if he really believes in it, though, I think it's something that, I, you know, maybe needs a little bit more time to get bedded in. Um, but if they haven't been practicing this all year with, you know, obviously the players are different. Eric Dyer is gone and Roderick Dragashin is in. Um, but if we're not familiar with this system because we didn't even want to let Eric Dyer on the training pitch, that's an issue. Uh, and I don't think that's what happened. I think it's just, you know, here's who we have available. Let's get a little bit more strong at the back. And it's not exactly worked out in the way that we hoped. So um, definitely expect that to be something else that changes moving forward. This is, January was a weird month. And, you know, the first week of February is, is weird for, uh, for everyone, but particularly us with the, not just the amount of players, but how important they have been to our season so far being gone um so now that it's behind us we can leave it in the review mirror let's just look forward and upwards on the table <laughs> i like that that's a good sentiment um and obviously talking about going forward and i know that we've spoken about our game management and and winnie there's been a lot to talk about whether Anne should change his tactics that late on in the game rather than playing this high line because even from that um set piece that free kick we still had a very very high line is it maybe time for Ange to reassess how, how he wants to play that late on in the game or do you think Ange is never going to change the way he plays I don't think Ange is ever going to change. I don't, even if Ange tried to convince himself, Ange wouldn't change. Uh, he's just, you know, that's that's how he is. I just, I just feel that I will be honest. Um, you know, I, I think you know we've got a great, great manager. You know, steady in the ship right now, uh, and and someone a manager that can bring us huge success in the future. And I genuinely do believe that this is the, this is probably the first time since um, the Pochettino era that I've been excited to be a Tottenham fan. Um, and you know where we can be in in the future, but I feel like he, I feel like now sometimes he just makes changes for the sake of it. Like you said, the the, the, the Dragosin one feels like it, he just wanted to bring him on just to make a substitution uh, and to give him some minutes in the game. Where you know he he, he Dragosin, although he's been watching the game, he's not mentally switched on for 85, 87, 88 minutes that everyone else has been. So you've got the the opportunity to to switch off. So I I feel like unless it's it's a fatigue issue or an injury issue. <clears throat> I'd like to see the team see out the rest of the game. Um, but, I mean, this is Ange. He, he's not going to change, is he? So we need to just ride it out and hopefully he learns those kind of mistakes as he goes along. 
Um, and who's, who, who am I to call them a mistake? I don't know. Do you know what I mean, I'm not, I'm not getting paid all this money, but for me, I would like to see less substitutions and less tactical changes because I think it kind of disrupts any fluidity and any solidity that you have in that, you know, 80 minutes that you've built up. Mm, no, I think that's a great point. And, and Chris, coming to you, you're kind of on the same boat as I don't think Ange is ever going to change the way he wants to play his way of football. Or do you think you agree with Winnie in a sense? Maybe he just needs to talk, uh, think about his substitutions a little bit more. Yeah, um, the, the, the the subs for me were frustrating, I must say. Um, but I think that we've got to remember how many problems and issues we've had on and off the pitch this season. And also, you know, how young a lot of these players are. I think we forget that a lot of the time. And I think that a lot of fans think that these players are robots. You know, they're human beings and uh, they work extremely hard. And Ange is trying to get the best out of these players. It's his first season at the club. He's been here for, what, seven, eight months and he's done a fantastic job. And I just think that there are a lot of exciting times to come under our manager. Um, and like I said at the very start, I don't think any of us would have thought that we'd be where we are now at this stage of the season. And what we've witnessed so far and all of the problems we've had with the injuries and suspensions and so on. You know, players going off on international duty in, in January, February time. Um, I think now it is about having a strong end to the season. And just trying to get Champions League football. I know that you know the the departures of both uh, cup competitions, the League Cup and the the FA Cup, were frustrating for us all. But it is all about hearing that Champions League music next season, and I'm sure we will. I'd love that, man. After obviously last season, or oh, this season, sorry, not having it, it, it's kind of brought back what it'll actually feel like to be playing uh, Champions League football again. Uh, but Dakota, it's all about perspective, isn't it? And and the fact that what Chris and Winnie have said, in a sense that. OK, we're frustrated with this game, but it's one game in the bigger picture, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, we've only we've lost, what is it, two in our last eight? Um, and the rest have been points at, at, at some amount. So even, you know, zooming out, even if a lot of those are draws, it's still not terrible. It, in the summer, I wanted top half and good vibes at the end of the season. And I think we're I think we're pretty comfortably going to have that. So I'm happy. Um, However, Ange has done such a good job that my expectations are no longer top half of the table in good vibes. They're now top four in good vibes. <laughs> so um, yeah. good on Ange for uh, making me reassess my expectations. And now it's time to deliver. Um, you know, th this I feel like that's been kind of the for me anyway, that's been my perspective of the club as a whole for the last few years of, OK, I can see what we're building towards. I can see the the point i can see the plan but now it's time to deliver and it seems like we've done some of that on the on the business end of uh the football and now it's time to do it on the pitch side of the football and i i have all confidence in the world that and is going to get us there um hopefully it's not as dramatic as it seems like it's going to be i'd like to you know not have ulcers towards the end of the season um and you know, be able to enjoy my my mornings, and you guys to enjoy your afternoons. Um, but also, what is football without the drama? So, if that happens, I I'll try to be happy too. Holly, Holly, can I also just say that Ange has already come out and said that we are thinking about the summer transfer window. Mm -hmm. What managers have ever done that in recent times? So, you know, we're, we're building something special. Ange is building something special. So, I think in the next couple of years, I think we have got some really exciting times coming up. I'm sure. so bloody excited. I feel like for, for once, it, we've waited so long for something to, to come along and it, and finally our, our patience is wearing off and it's going to actually work and amount to something. Um, but, it, but, but it's about the planning, the recruitment mm -hmm. has been really good since Andrew's come in. We had, you know, we had a really good window in the summer, a good window in January. Not many clubs, including our North London rivals Arsenal, did any business in January. We got it done very early. Of course, we're signing great young players as well. Uh, players are choosing us over top European clubs. So exciting times, as I keep saying. Mm. Yeah, Dra Dragishin was the most expensive signing in all of Europe. Yeah. Who would have thought that about Tottenham Hotspur? Little old Tottenham Hotspur. <laughs> the, most, the biggest spenders in a January window. It's madness. I just love the fact that we're proactive. I think that's just been my, my biggest 
gripe in the sense that we always leave things last minute, a bit like when I plan shows, but I'm not <laughs> running a football club, so it don't matter. Um, but obviously, like we said, we're, we're looking forward to the he- uh, ahead. I love the fact that Dakota says um, vibes and it's still the vibe kind of thing, feeling with everything, which is amazing. Um, but we're going to move to Brighton. And Winnie, I'm going to give uh, you the questions first. What do you kind of make of this game and, and what do you feel going into it? Um, Brighton are a, a weird side at the moment. You know, they got absolutely battered um, by Luton and then went and battered uh, Crystal Palace. So it's, look, it, it, they're, a, they're a side that I don't enjoy playing um, because for some reason we don't seem to do well against them um, or, or from, from, you know, from what I can see anyway. Um, I'm expecting probably a tough game. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's a, a, a game at home that I expect us to win. I expect us to win our home games. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm even seeing games against like the, the, the traditional top six where we, where the Tottenham of old would roll over and, you know, we, we'd end up losing three or four nil or something like that. And we, we, we're putting up a good fight under Ange. So, again, it's a home game against Brighton. I do, do, I do expect us to win, but I don't expect it to be uh, an easy game by any stretch of the imagination because... I feel like people, you know, the Lewis Dunk, people like that, they, they, they just like to bully us. Uh, and I feel like he's going to have a big thing to say. And I just, you know, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for it, obviously, because I'm excited for every Spurs game now. But um, I, I am slightly nervous about this one, I must admit. But I, still, I do still expect us to win. I think it's the fact that it's a home game. I think that's what I, I'm looking forward ahead of. I think like home games, we've got every advantage in our favour. I mean, Chris, how are you kind of feeling with this one? Well, Winnie there says, I expect to win. I think that's every single Spurs fan this season. We're going to every game now expecting to win because, of course, we're under Ange. But this Brighton game is going to be very, very difficult. Um, away at the Amex on the, uh, I think it was the 28th of December, a very, very tough game. They absolutely battered us and uh, it could have been a lot more goals um, in the end. Um, but, yeah, it's going to be a very tough game. I like Deserby as a coach, plays some super entertaining football and uh, sets his teams up extremely well. Uh, but also, as Winnie said, uh, you know, to, to lose against Luton away um, and then the very next week, you know, to beat Crystal Palace in the in the manner that they did. Um, you, you don't really know what you're going to get from them, but they're going to work extremely hard. It's going to be tough. Um, but I also expect us to win. <laughs> I think that's the thing. I think we've just got that nature about us. I don't think it's a cocky kind of nature. It's just the fact we just enjoy our football. And I think the players enjoy the football they're playing as well. But Dakota, how do you how do you feel? Are you feeling the same kind of vibe? Yeah, I'll hop on, I'll hop on the, the let's win wagon. Um, I think, too, I, we've got to put that last match in a little bit of context. You know, we had, we're coming off the back of just an absolutely brutal schedule. Um, and... Now we've got, you know, a little bit of rest with us. Um, we did the the double over Brighton last season, I think, but the two seasons prior, we've split. Um, actually, the away team won each of those previous four matchups, I think, um, in the two seasons prior to last one. So it's always, it's been kind of a weird series with Brighton. And, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll be back to, you know, probably 80% strength by then and playing at home for this match and the next two are going to be so vital for how the rest of our season can go. Um, it's an excellent time to, to get on a good roll and to find some form as a team and, um, you know, keep the March towards top four going and, uh, keep the vibes high. So yeah, let's go win. Let's beat them handily and sing all night long. Let's do it. Love it. I love it. I mean, it would be great, obviously, to, to be able to get three points uh, off them. But Winnie, there's been a lot of discussion, obviously, about that midfield. Do you? How do you kind of see us setting up that midfield against Brighton? It's. It's. I mean, for me, um, our, our probably three best midfielders um, should all be available to play. In the sense, it would be Madison, Benton, Core, and Saar. Uh, and I know, obviously, people, that's up for debate because people like Decky in there. But for me, they're, they're, they're my three midfielders going forward. And as you say, Saar hopefully should be should be OK to start this game. Um, Mad is, again, obviously a little bit more fitness from coming back from his injury. And, and Benton Core, I mean, what a player he is. Uh, he, he's absolutely sensational. So I would like to see us set up that way. But again, this is Angie. He may, he may have different ideas, but I would like to see that be the three because uh, I feel like that, that, that three is sensational. I don't think there's many better three uh, a midfield three in, in the Premier League to be perfectly honest mm. or maybe I'm biased I don't know but <laughs> I, don't think so. 
I saw like some weird, I mean, you see lots of bizarre things on Twitter, but Chris, I saw that people were saying they don't necessarily think that Ben Tinker and, and Madison kind of fit each other very well. Do you, do you think that's a bizarre take or do you kind of see it? Because I don't know if Ben Tinker played very well uh, against Everton. Now, I saw he took a little bit of uh, battering on uh, on X on uh, on Saturday, but who doesn't? I mean, and it just seems that, I don't know, some, some of our fan base just want to bat some players sometimes. And now like Eric Dyer and... And players like that have gone. It's, it's like, who do we pick on now? But I think Benton Kerr is a, a superb midfielder. And I completely agree with everything Winnie said there about those three. I think they're our best three uh, going forward. But the thing for me, I, I think that in these next few weeks, we're going to start getting all of our players back. And just never had the whole squad fit and available, uh, you know, during this season. So that's very, very exciting, you know, at the business end of the season. And when you look at the next six or seven fixtures, there is at least one week. And I think that we've got a couple of fixtures where there's a two week break. So we've got time to refresh. We've got time to, you know, put, uh, you know, the, the best starting 11 out and, uh, and and get these jobs done. But Benton Kerr, I think, is a, a fantastic midfielder. And I think that is the difference of, uh, you know, perhaps sometimes when uh, fans go to games and when fans just watch it on the TV, because Benton Kerr, the, the 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 crowd didn't stop singing his name on Saturday, and uh, you know they gave him some great support on Saturday. But yeah, superb midfielder, and I think that you know some fans forget that it was it was him and Kulusevski that got us Champions League. Indeed, that is very true, and I think that's the thing. I think with H, you sometimes have to take it with a pinch of salt. Um, but Dakota, for you as well, obviously we've spoken a little bit about the midfield, um, and I want to talk um, a little bit about Werner because I actually forgot to mention it uh, in the Everton game. In a sense that he had a few good opportunities to put himself on the on the score sheet, but it just didn't come. Do you think he's a player that maybe lacks a little bit of confidence, uh, unconfidence, sorry, in front of goal? Do you think? Um, maybe. I, I think, too, he's played, what, three or four games with us? He he played, like, 17 minutes with Leipzig in the first half of the season. So I think some of it is he's still finding his legs a little bit. Um, I think it's a different thing finishing those chances in training, and it's another thing on the pitch with a crowd full of people um, yelling probably not nice things at you while you're trying to focus and score. So I, I think Timo will, will start – uh, putting those chances away, he's getting in plenty of positions to do so, um, which is, uh, I think, a reason that I'm I'm not super worried about a draw away to Everton or, um, you know, the the performance against Brentford because we're getting in positions. We've just maybe got to be that little bit more clinical um, or you know that little bit more patient, a little bit more direct at times. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not. Not necessarily concerned about Timo. Um, he's contributing with assists, um, and it seems like he's a wonderful human being, uh, which is, according to Ange, and I, I am of this philosophy too, just as important uh, as being a good player is being a good person. So I think he fits well in in the squad. When Sonny comes back, he's not going to have any issues with dropping to the bench and you know coming on to for the last 10, 15 minutes to run at tired legs, um, which is going to be an exciting thing to be able to bring on Timo Werner and Brennan Johnson um, after they've been chasing around probably Richarlison and Dan Kulisewski for for 80 minutes. Um, it's, it's an exciting thing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not concerned about Timo. I'm looking forward to his first goal. Uh, I think we're going to see a similar reaction from him like we saw from Dan Kulisevsky earlier this season. Didn't have the greatest start to the season. He finally scored his first goal. Didn't even run to the corner. Just stood up from being knocked over and just yelled. I think we're going to see something similar from, from Timo, uh, and I'm excited for that to happen. I think we all are. I think it's just the final hurdle that he needs to make because he's got all the assists. He just needs to put yeah. the ball uh, in the back of the net. Um, before we go, I kind of want to ask one more question. And Winnie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you for this one and I'll ask uh, uh, Chris and the coat for the last two questions. And Winnie, that is, I know Chris has mentioned that Andrew's going to have a pretty big headache uh, when all these players come available. I mean, it's not a bad thing to have, but when he uh, Sonny does come back, where do you see Richardson playing? Because obviously he's on form at the moment. Do you drop him out wide or do you drop him entirely? What what what's the kind of deal with that? Do you think? Um, 
if a player's in form, there's no reason why you should drop them at all. For, you know, even even for someone as good as Sonny. But I I, w- I expect Sonny to, you know, at the start of the season, um, there was there was talks of Sonny being out wide. Then we dropped Sonny into the into like the number nine position, and he started scoring bags and bags of goals. But then that kind of drifted off a little bit, and we stuck him out wide again, and he started to hit a little bit of form again. So I think Sonny's someone who is so interchangeable. We could put him anywhere, um, and and one he would give a hundred percent, and two I think he would he would do a fantastic job um but yeah i i sadly even though as good as as good as timo has been i fully expect uh richarlison to stay in that number nine role where he's been and sonny to drop in on the left hand side um because if it's a choice of sonny and timo I, I, you know as good as he's been sonny's going straight back in there uh, but you can't displace R- richie the way that you know the form that he's in at all so that's what i expect especially with his confidence as well. As we know, he's a confidence player. You don't want to drop him um, from where he's scoring. Um, and Chris, I'll come to you because obviously there's been a lot of discussion about uh, Decky. He's not potentially performing at the height he should be, kind of dropping off like he was at the start of the season. What's your kind of take on that? Is that is that another player that you just need to let have time and he'll be fine again? Yeah, I think he's done very well, actually, in that central role. And uh, But of course, that can't continue because we've got other players there. Um, but... I, I see him playing on the right, and uh, I can't quite believe you asked that question about Richarlison. Drop him, Richarlison. I know. Like, Boom. This, I thought, this is what I, I mean. I that right? <laughs> <laughs> I've done some guest appearances for a while. Now my hosting's gone out the window. <laughs> I, I think uh, I think Son on the left, Richarlison in the middle, and, and, and Kulusevski on the right. But um, you know, Kulusevski, I, I think there is a lot more to come from him. Um, but. As I keep saying, I think that Ange um, is a master at getting the best out of players. Um, and what has really impressed me of Ange as well, you know, I know we've had a lot of injuries and suspensions and we've kind of been forced into it, but he loves versatile players. He loves players that can play in a, in a number of different positions and, uh, you know, he will get the best out of them. And, uh, and I, I think that he will get the best out of Kulisewski as well. I think that's the thing. All these players are so interchangeable um, in the front three. It just means that I know I said he's got a headache, but it's almost like he can swap and change when he pleases if something isn't quite working out. Um, so it is a great position to have. And Dakota, I'll come to you for the last question. And that is, do you see us hitting top four? I know you said in the show that you said at the start of the season, you just wanted vibes. But are you now thinking this could be a reality? Yeah, I think it would be at this point in time, um, not the worst thing, but I think we would all be a little disappointed. Um, not not hitting top four. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day, like what is best case scenario for us, you know, moving forward, looking at the window, looking at next season. And, you know, I'm taking everything into consideration. Uh, it wouldn't be the worst thing to finish third or fourth, have that Champions League pull for the summer window. Um finish third in our group, <laughs> go to the Europa League and win that thing. And, uh, you know, I think that would that would be nice. Obviously, winning the Champions League is ideal, but trying to keep myself a little bit realistic and pump my brakes some. So let's get drawn to the group of death. Let's beat the two the two taller ones. Let's do, do all the things. It's, and, it's, it's the new format. It's the new format next season. Oh, you're right. You're right. Ooh, I forgot about that. Then my whole, I've got to think about this all over again. But yes, Holly, top four is the expectation now. And I think we'll get there. I love it. I love it. I think, I think like you said, I think the fact that we're all on this hype train of Ange, but it's almost like now he's kind of oversold it to us and we want more from him. But it's a nice position to be because I don't think I've enjoyed football watching Spurs this this long for a very long time i think it's been a long time coming and i'm very pleased uh, that we were here uh but yeah i think that kind of wraps everything up hopefully next monday uh i've got my better hosting hat on um because my questions tonight were all over the gaff uh so please excuse me uh but thank you to everybody that has tuned in and to my amazing guests so we'll go around uh, the table first of all winnie thank you so much for joining me where can everybody find you no thank you for having me uh yeah part lane pod um, every Sunday, 7 p.m. Uh, check us out. Firstly, if you are listening or watching and you're not subscribed to Holly, obviously, absolutely go and do that. Then come over and check Park Lane Pod and subscribe to that. And obviously, the guys down the bottom as well, check them out because um, uh, you know uh, the support is, is is greatly appreciated. Regardless, you know we're a little Tottenham community, so everyone just just support each other. 
Um, but we have got a, a big announcement coming on Park Lane Pod uh, soon. So, you know, if you are subscribed and you're, you follow us, then hopefully you'll be looking forward to it too. Oh, I like it. No, thank you, Annie. Like you said, we're all Spurs fans. So it's nice to obviously chat Spurs and support one another. So thank you. And Chris as well. Thank you again for tonight. Where can everybody find you? Holly, thank you so much. Um, Tottenham fan Chris Cowlin on YouTube. Um, the Spurs Chat Podcast, of course, we record all the time and you're a very special guest on, on a number of occasions. So thank you for that. And uh, great to be on with you guys. Um, Winnie, I can't believe how how much we have in common and, uh, and and share the same views. So thank you and nice to meet you both. Yeah. Thank you, mate. No, cheers. Thank you. Like I say, I think where I've been out of the game hosting for a couple of weeks, I've, <laughs> I've totally lost it tonight. Um, but no, thank you guys. Thank you again to everybody. And also Dakota, where can everybody uh, find you too, my friend? Yeah, I'm at Dakota J. Booth right here on all the socials. You can also uh, hear my voice like you're doing right now. Um, at Tottenham Depot podcast. We also do, we, we make a point to cover the women's team as well. So um, the women's team also had a pretty disappointing draw against the Liverpool women um, at the weekend. So come commiserate with us over there uh, at the Tottenham Depot podcast. <laughs> no, thank you, Dakota. Like I say, it's always nice to to have your perspective, obviously, from across the pond. And honestly, I don't know how you do it getting up for games so early in the morning. So uh, credit to you. Not too bad for me. It's a seven thirty kickoff this morning. Um, got some friends who who do wake up at four thirty and usually fall asleep at halftime, and then we've got to tell them about what happened in the second half. But <laughs> not me yet. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's amazing. But no, thank you again, everyone. Uh, thank you to my guests. Like I say, Holly Sotsu is live. I'll be back uh, next Monday, same time, when I'll have my better head on. <laughs> um, so make sure you tune in for that one. Until next time, Cody Spurs.